Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about one of the most fascinating of all questions in computer science and the digital revolution, which is, can machines think? That's at the core of the field we sometimes call artificial intelligence. Will we be able someday to build machines that'll replicate humans, maybe even replace humans, that will think just the way humans do? Of course, that goes back a bit to the original question we began the course with, which was uh, Ada Lovelace, who said in her notes on the analytical engine by her friend Charles Babbage, that machines will be able to do everything. They can be notated in symbols, except for one thing. They will not, they, the, they will have no pretensions whatever to originate anything. They can do what we program them to do, what we instruct them to do, Machines will be able to follow analysis, but they won't be able to originate thoughts on their own. They won't really be thinking. The question of machines thinking goes all the way back to Rene Descartes, the French philosopher who did, I think, therefore I am, the cogito ergo sum. And in that essay, he talked about, well, maybe machines will be able to think just like humans. He said, no, there are a couple of reasons that we know that machines will never think the way humans do. First of all, uh, they won't be able to carry on conversations. They won't be able to have sentences where they understand the meaning of the sentences and thus can converse. And then secondly, he said that uh, they would inevitably fail at some actions, even if they did a lot of actions very well. And after a while, we'd realize they weren't conscious. They really weren't true brains, they were just processing material. One of the great discussions about this came when the two heroes of uh, our course from 1937, Claude Shannon on the left and Alan Turing on the right, met at Bell Labs. Turing sailed from England in the middle of World War II, goes over to Bell Labs, and both Shannon and Turing had written papers published in 1937 that had something in common. Basically, Turing said there could be a universal computing machine based on on-off switches, do all logic with yes, no, yes, no, and even determine what problems were unanswerable. Shannon figured out that you could do that type of uh, logic, that type of algebra in circuits, circuits that had switches that turned on and off. And because a the machine they felt using binary instructions could tackle not just math, but all of logic, then at least to them, maybe machines could be like human brains, because in theory, that's what human brains do, is just logic. And so machines could replicate human intelligence. They used to sit in the lunchroom of Bell Labs and have very loud discussions about it, including sometimes with people nearby. At one point, Shannon says about Turing, uh, he wants to put data into a machine, not just data though, he wants to add cultural things. He wants to play music to it. He wants to teach a machine how to do music. And people said to Turing, are you trying to create a powerful human brain? And he said, no. I'm not interested in developing a powerful brain. All I'm after is just a mediocre brain, something like the president of AT&T, the person who ran Bell Labs. Sometimes we think of um, machines thinking, uh, but I think of chess playing machines. Like, can we develop a machine that can play chess, which of course we now have. Well, chess is just a pure rules-based game. So that doesn't get us very far. Uh, this picture here is a bit of a joke because it was something called Mechanical Turk. It was one of the first chess machines that could actually play and beat humans. Uh, the little trick was in that box below, there was actually a real human picking out the chess moves and figuring out what to do. Now, you know, by brute force, we've created machines that can pretty much process 50, 60, 70 moves in advance and just figure them all out and basically win at chess. Uh, when they took the uh, game Go, the 
uh, game, the Asian game Go, which is even more complicated. It took a while for a machine to be able to win at Go. It was called the machine called AlphaGo. And the way it worked was it was not just using brute force. It in, instructed itself. It was machine learning, as we call it. In other words, it would just play hundreds of thousands and then millions of games and learn what worked and what didn't, rather than try to figure out, you know, various uh, rules or algorithms for doing it. Uh, so this caused, uh, I mean, early on, Turing was thinking, if you want to really do an intelligent machine, you don't do it by trying to program in every possible answer. You have a machine that doesn't just do what it's instructed to do, but it can teach itself. It can learn itself. Uh, just like a pupil who had learned from a master, is what Turing writes, but uh, adds much more through their own life experiences. In other words, you let the machine just go observe and do things, and it begins to learn in a way that eventually, if it's powerful enough, will replicate everything humans know. In other words, don't prog this is one of his quotes, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates a child's mind? Why? Because a child can go out and learn. Uh, he joked in one of his papers, you couldn't really send uh, this computer out to a school to learn because other children make fun of it. But you could have a system where it got rewards and punishments. It knew when it got things right, knew when it got things wrong, and from that would figure things out. Uh, this leads to a great debate in England. I mean, the British love this sort of thing. And so during the 1940s, when Turing is uh, discussing these things, uh, there is a debate about whether or not uh, he's right that a machine can think. Uh, at one point, uh, a guy named Sir Jeffrey uh, Jefferson, a great uh, medical uh, researcher, said, until a machine can write sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by just the chance of the fall of symbols, could we agree that a machine equals the brain? In other words, if it could do something artistic. This is something that Sir Jeffrey Jefferson said in the lecture, trying to refute some of Turing's ideas. Turing writes a letter to the Times of London and says the comparison is perhaps a little bit unfair because perhaps a sonnet written by a machine will be better appreciated by another machine. Uh, he was sort of joking, but he was saying, hey, why do we think that our form of intelligence or our tastes uh, are usually the best? It ends up that in 1950, he writes one of the most famous and still the most cited articles in the whole field of uh, artificial intelligence and consciousness. He writes a piece called Computing Machines and Intelligence. And it has a wonderful opening sentence that says, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And as you see by the title of it there, uh, of that section, it's called The Imitation Game. Later on, he has another section called Ada Lovelace's Objection, in which he takes on Ada. But first, let's look at The Imitation Game. Uh, that, of course, was the name of the Benedict Cumberbatch movie, in which he plays Turing. And the notion of The Imitation Game that Turing came up with is you take a, a guy, take somebody, a guy or a gal, and put them outside two doors. And that person gets to send in questions to each of the rooms. Sends in questions to the rooms and tries to figure out from the answers what's in the room. In one room, you have a person. In the other room, you have a computer. And he says that if you can't tell after a certain amount of time whether you're conversing with a computer or with a person, then there's no logical reason for you to be able to say that the machine isn't thinking. If you can't distinguish between what a machine does and what a human does, then you have no 
evidence, no empirical reason to believe that the machine and the human aren't doing the same thing. And so what he would do in the imitation game is come up with ways to figure out what is the human. For example, uh, this is in his paper. He said, here's some examples of a conversation that could occur. Uh, one of them was, please write a sonnet on the, uh, about the fourth bridge. And the answer you get back is, count me out on this one. I can never write poetry. And then you send in a question, add 34957 to 70,764. And after about 30 seconds, the machine spits out an answer. Say, do you play chess? And yes, and you give it a chess puzzle. And after a pause, the machine says, all right, here's the move I would make, and it would be checkmate. How do you figure out whether that was a machine or not? Well, you know, couldn't write poetry. Was that a human saying that? Uh, by the way, look at the addition problem carefully. Whatever it is, a machine or a human, they get the answer wrong. Does that prove it's a human? Or maybe it's a machine that knows how to fake being a human. And even that question of writing a sonnet. You send in a question, say, shall I compare, uh, write uh, in the first line of your sonnet, which reads, shall I compare it to a summer's day? Wouldn't a spring day do as well or better? And the answer comes back, it wouldn't scan. Well, how about a winter's day? That would scan all right. Yeah, but nobody wants to be compared to a winter's day. What Turing is doing is showing a type of conversation. And as you look at these conversations, as you think about them, maybe you're not sure whether it's a human or a machine doing it. And he poked at the pretensions of all those people who prattled on about sonnets, but also about consciousness. He said, one day, ladies will take their computers for walks in the park and tell each other, my little computer said such a funny thing this morning. There were some theological objections, uh, people feeling that only God has bestowed, could bestow a soul and thinking capacity, and he does it only on humans. As Turing said, well, that sort of means you don't have an omnipotent, all-powerful God, because if he has the power to confer a soul on an elephant or a human, if he sees fit, why couldn't he do it for a machine if he so desired? The greatest um, challenge, to the Turing imitation game comes from a philosopher out at Berkeley named John Searle. And in 1980, he writes a paper called The Chinese Room, in which he's trying to show that what Turing proves with his imitation game, where perhaps you can finally get a game in which you can't tell the difference between a computer and a human, but that's meaningless. Even if you can't tell the difference, a human has consciousness, the machine doesn't. A human understands everything that it's saying and you're saying. A machine may be able to fake it, but it has no consciousness and doesn't understand anything. And so he has what he's called, what uh, Searle calls the Chinese room. It's almost like the imitation game. On the left, you see somebody puts in a question. Then in the room, there's a person who speaks absolutely no Chinese, but has a rule book that says, whenever you get this symbol, do this. And if it's a big enough rule book and whatever, it can make it so that you can do an output that seems sensible in Chinese. But as Searle said, if that's happening inside the box, the person still doesn't understand a word of Chinese. He doesn't have consciousness. He doesn't have understanding. The BBC television network decided to have a debate with Turing and a few others on whether or not machines could think. And uh, the people who debated against Turing said, well, if they're really gonna be like humans, it's not just logic they need to have. They need to have a set of appetites, desires, you know, intuition. And machines have restricted appetites. They can't blush when they're embarrassed. The conversation actually turns quite sexual. It's like, you know, man has sexual urges and may make a fool of himself. And there was even something I wouldn't believe a machine is thinking until it can 
touch the thigh of a woman and have emotions, all these things. Turing remained silent during that whole period. Turing was somewhat secretly, although his friends knew, he was gay. And perhaps that even influenced him because he felt it wasn't a matter of sexual choice. It was uh, how he was programmed. He was born that way. And he felt that, you know, in some ways humans ha are pre-programmed to be whatever they are. And it made him perhaps think that humans and machines are not as distinguishable as we said. Uh, in 1954, right after that debate, Turing commits suicide by biting into a cyanide-laced apple. He had been convicted of gross indecency for having picked up a male uh, friend and uh, they had an affair and the male friend turned against him. It was a messy sort of thing. And when Turing has to go to trial, they offer him the chance of having hormone treatments as if he wants to reprogram his body or spend time in jail or whatever. He starts doing the hormone treatment, but eventually commits suicide. Now, by the way, as we try to figure out if machines can think like humans, we have to ask ourselves, was that something a machine would have done? And finally, one more thing as Steve Jobs would say, my daughter once told me that the original Apple logo, which you see there, which had many colors on it, uh, was supposed to represent the apple that Alan Turing bent into, bent into. And indeed, the stripes were supposed to represent, to some extent, uh, the gay flag. I once asked Steve Jobs, is this true? Is that why you have the bite into the apple? Is it an homage to Alan Turing? And he said, alas, I wish I had been clever enough to think about that. We just did it with an apple with a bite into it, uh, simply because it looked like a better logo. I want you to think about the basic question and rest assured of this, there's no right answer. Nobody has fully figured it out, but so many people have written about uh, the imitation game, about Alan Turing's paper on Can Machines Think, and about artificial intelligence. Will it ever get us to computers that will think like and replicate and maybe replace humans? And look into your own consciousness, look into the way you think, and try to figure out what you feel about whether machines will someday be able to think.